How deep, O oh God, your love for us. We, we have brought filthy garments and dirty lips and blood on our hands. And you have loved us. We were your enemies. And you loved us. We were helpless and weak and vile. And you loved us. You loved us at our worst. And it's all we could bring. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you for your love, that you would look down on us in our pitiable state, our miserable state, our rebellious state. And you did not do with us what we would do. In your infinite offense, your love exceeded your anger against our sin and swallowed it up. And we trifle with such petty offenses and your infinite honor was satisfied by the death of your son in our place because you loved us. It is a joy for us on this sobering night to remember the death of the Holy One, the beautiful one, the beloved son, the word incarnate, the Messiah, the sinless one crucified in our place because you loved us. We thank you and worship you in the name of your Son. Amen. You may be seated. We would love for you this evening to open your Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles here for you and some servants that would love to pass those out. If you don't have a Bible, just lift your hand up. These gentlemen would love to put a copy of God's Word in your hands. If you don't own a Bible, this is our gift to you to keep. There you go, Bobby. Perfect. Um, and we want you to have God's Word. We want you to be able to look along this evening as we reflect on the death of Christ Turn in those Bibles to Luke chapter 19. We're going to read together two verses. And in, in my copy of God's Word, these verses are separated by a heading. We're going to skip over the heading and sew these verses back together and see a remarkable contrast. Would you put your eyes this evening and your heart on Luke 19? Verses 27 and 28. Luke 19, 27 and 28. These are the words of Christ. He says, But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. After Jesus had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. What we see in these two verses is a stark contrast. It is the contrast between God's anger at sin and His love for sinners. They're both here in these two verses, back to back. Verse 27 picks up the end of a parable, a story Jesus tells to illustrate a significant point. And that story begins back in verse 11. There's a striking narrative at the beginning of chapter 19 where Jesus utters a declaration of forgiveness to the worst sinner his hearers could imagine. A tax collector, a sellout. A thief. And that narrative ends with the statement, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. This is God's love for the worst of the worst. Verse 11 begins the story. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, 
a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. He called ten of his slaves and he gave them ten minas. And he said to them, engage in business until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And it happened that when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know how much they had made in business. And verses 16 through 25 tell us this nobleman or this king's dealings with those slaves. What I want to focus on this evening is the king's dealings with his subjects who said, we don't want him to reign over us. And what happens to them? The king returns in verse 15. And verses 15 to 26 give the accountability for those 10 slaves. The, the, this parable is telling a story and we need to understand who the story is about. The nobleman, the king, is of course Jesus. Depicted in his Old Testament sense and his first coming. And then in his second coming. A nobleman comes to secure for himself a kingdom and then he leaves and he comes back. The nobleman has spoken in a sense to the nation of Israel, his subjects, and, and in another sense the entire world who properly are his subjects by right of creation. And humanity as a whole and Israel as a nation in specific have said, we don't want that king. And Jesus comes to those who are called his slaves, or the nobleman comes to his slaves. And, and this is Jesus speaking to those who will follow him. And he dispenses minas. It's a measurement of money. A mina was a hundred days wages. I'll let you do the math and think about one third of your annual income. And this amount of money was distributed to each of ten slaves. And the expectation is that these servants of this king will do business with the king's money and bring a return. They, they must be interested in the king's business. They must see this opportunity, money, relationships, time, life as a stewardship. Not to be held on to, not to be squandered, but to be invested for a return for the king's interest. And those who would squander the, the king's stewardship, or who would hold on to it tightly without investment, are actually seen as enemies of the king in the parable. And that's all sandwiched in between what happens to these subjects of the king's realm, which is everybody. Look down at verse 27. These enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. There's accountability for those who would follow the king and dispense with his investment. But then there is accountability for all of the people who are proper subjects of his realm for how they were related to the king. And those who don't want him to be king are to be assessed and destroyed. This is a rightful response of a king to his rightful subjects. And as the parable depicts Jesus, the king of kings, the creator and owner of all things, it is right for him to be angry at those who would say, I don't like you, I don't want you, get out of my life. And the end of such rebellion is seen in verse 27. But the next verse, verse 28 shows the king, now we're outside of the parable. Now we're looking at Jesus' actions himself. The, the king of the parable is Jesus in real life. After he said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Where is Jesus headed 
He's headed to his own death. He's headed to the cross. He's headed to the place where his creatures will string him up and murder him. This is love. Jesus is not a victim here. He intends to go outside the city to be killed as a criminal at the hands of his creatures. But more than that, as we read from Isaiah 53 and as we just sung, to be crushed by his Holy Father for love of rebellious subjects. This contrast is the theme of the Bible. This was depicted earlier in the book of Luke, in Luke 12, 49 and 50. Jesus cried out, I have come to cast fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have an immersion, a baptism to undergo, and how distressed of soul am I until it is accomplished. Jesus said, I have come rightfully to judge the earth. But before that, I'm going to go under the wrath of my Father and be judged for sin, the sins of others. This is the contrast in Isaiah 6. The thrice holy God levels a godly man who sees himself as a sinner with unclean lips. <coughs> I think I sang too much. <coughs> if there's a water nearby. And a holy God who would expose and level and judge sin is the God who is the source of forgiveness and cleansing and commissioning for Isaiah. In Revelation chapter 1, John the Apostle sees the glorified Christ in all of his uncloaked glory. And John sees him and falls before him as a dead man. And the same Jesus who will judge the world for sin put his hand on John's shoulder, signifying comfort and acceptance and a commissioning for usefulness. We see this same contrast in Revelation 5, 5 and 6. The Apostle John turns to see the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the King of all kings, the Conqueror. And he sees a Lamb standing as if slain, bearing the marks of his substitutionary atonement, where he went silent as a sheep before its shearers, like a lamb to the slaughter, to pay for sin. The rightful, holy anger of Christ against sin is juxtaposed to the love of Christ for sinners. And so we take refuge in the very one who has the right to judge. This is love. Of the most infinite sort. A kind of love you and I cannot measure. The holy, infinite justice of God was met by love in the sacrifice of Christ. What kind of reign would you expect from a king who would lay down his life for his subjects? A reign that is made possible by love will be characterized by love into eternity. This king is love. There is no one like him. There is no reign like this. There is no subjection like subjection to Christ. His reign as king over his subjects is infinite love. And I want to speak to you this evening 
who have not yet surrendered to Christ as King. What more could you want in a Savior? What more could you want in a Lord or a King? There's no one like Him. And if you think for a moment, well, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I just want to be free. You need to know it's a lie. If you're not subject to Christ, you are subject to something. What is life without Him? Bondage to sin? A slavery to fear? Shackles of emptiness and disappointment and decay and corruption and inevitably death. They are your king, if not Christ. What do you get for your rejection of Christ? What do you, what do you benefit by rejecting life and joy and fulfillment and everything in him? The very one with the right to judge and kill laid aside his robe and his crown and his scepter and he walked up a hill outside of Jerusalem to be clothed in your sin for love, for his own glory, the own display, the display of his own character. This evening we're going to take communion. And the men are going to go now and prepare the elements, the symbols of Christ's body and his blood. A piece of bread that we eat and some juice that we drink. And we eat and we drink to remember and to proclaim the death of our King, the death of our Savior. Good Friday, as Chris said earlier, is a strange title for this day. It's a somber remembrance. It marks the worst thing humanity has ever done. Deicide. The killing of God. When mankind had the chance to kill his maker, we did. The cross itself is an emblem of death, of shame, of weakness, of scandal of criminality, an emblem of the curse of God. Why is it good? Why do we boast? Why do we sing of this cross? Because the cross, even though it is an emblem of death, is also the emblem of life for us who believe. His death so we can live. And yes, an emblem of shame, the King of Kings mocked and beaten and scourged and scorned to remove our shame, the shame of the filth of our guilt. And it is an emblem of weakness, and yet it is the power of God for those who believe to overcome our own weakness, our own helplessness as sinners. It is an emblem of scandal. A stumbling block that the promised son of David, the king of Israel, would be hung outside of town like a common criminal. And yet it is the fulfillment of what that promised one would come to do. To remove the scandal of our sin against God. The cross is the emblem of criminality. But of course, they were our crimes that were punished there. It is the emblem of the curse of God. But it was Christ who was made a curse for us. In order that the curse of sin and death and all of its consequences would be lifted from us forever. That's why it is Good Friday. I hope you see yourself in verse 27 of Luke 19. These enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them. And a death sentence. If you're a believer here tonight, that is your story. But it doesn't end there. We were all born this way, naturally, enemies of God. It is the natural condition of humanity that results in sins of every kind. Sins of action, 
sins in our words, sins in our motives and our thoughts, they all spill out of this natural born rebellion against God. We're all there in verse 27. Born enemies, not wanting God to reign. But I hope you see your Savior in verse 28, the one going off to Jerusalem, the one going to his own death in order to secure the rescue of the very ones who rebelled, even for those who called for his death. We are the problem, and Christ is the solution. The men can come forward at this point to distribute the bread and the juice, Take these symbols and hold on to them. We will have a few moments of silence. That is an opportunity for you to examine your own heart. These symbols are only for believers. If you have not surrendered to King Jesus, if you have not believed that His death in your place pays for your sins personally, then this remembrance is not for you. This proclamation is for those who have placed their faith in Christ. Hold on to these for some moments of silence to rejoice in the cross work of Christ, believer, to examine your own heart, confess any known sins. And for you who don't yet know Christ, to think about your life without Him. Don't leave here tonight without surrendering to Christ. Talk to somebody that brought you. Talk to any of the people up here. Talk to someone next to you about what it means to know King Jesus personally. After a few moments of silence, the band will lead us in singing. Again, hold on to these while we sing together. You can remain seated. And then I'll come back up at the end of the song and... We'll take these symbols together.